Do you suffer from charge anxiety? Do I really have enough charge to get to where I need to go? Do you get to work hours before you need to just to get the best charger? Do you think about grid modernization and have regular conversations about it with your friends? Well, this may be just me then. <laughs> yes, the electrification revolution has begun. Now we just need to build up the infrastructure to support it. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. In this episode of Chalk Talk, Andreas Nadler from Worth Electronic and I investigate e-mobility charging stations and wall boxes. We take a closer look at the benefits, components, and functions of AC and DC wall boxes and charging stations. We also examine the role that DC link capacitors play in power conversion and how Worth Electronic can help you create your next AC and DC wall box or charging station design. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about this topic from Worth Electronic. Hi, Andreas. Thank you so much for joining me today. Hi, Amelia. So we're talking all about e-mobility charging stations and wall boxes today. But Andreas, before we get started, can you explain the differences between these two types of charging stations? Yes. So we got four different charging modes, but only two of them are really interesting for the majority of EV charging people, let's say. So one is the mode free. The mode free is intended for charging at home. So usually maximum 11 up to 22 kilowatts charging power. This is then the main charging point for most of the people when they park their car at home. And the second interesting one is the charging mode 4. It's DC charging only. This is intended to use beside highways for fast charging. The goal is to have between 10 and 15 minutes. You can charge up your car 300 kilometers and then you will go forward again. And this is the way it will be in future all over. Fantastic. Now, Andreas, can you also talk about the differences between AC and DC charging? Well, as the name implies, AC charging directly feed in from the AC grid, the voltage into your car. Inside the car, then we will find a so-called onboard charger, OBC. The onboard charger then converts the AC voltage into a DC voltage. And with the DC voltage, we can directly charge up the traction battery of the car. If we're now talking about DC charging, then we directly feed in the DC voltage from usually the high power hypercharging station at the highways directly into the traction battery, which is much more efficient and faster. So you do not have to do the conversion again between DC and AC and AC and DC. Okay, so Andreas, can we dig into the details of the AC wall box first? Yes, we can. If you take a closer look inside the wall box, uh, the AC grid connection, then after the AC grid, you need the so-called RCD type A line fuse. This is needed to protect the wiring and all the components against overcurrent. So there will be no fire or no blown up fuses. Afterwards, we need some kind of a surge protection. This will help against over voltages when you have a lightning strike in closer area or a few kilometers away from your charging pile. And then we need some EMI filtering, usually only for one of the three phases because the auxiliary supply we will see uh, later on is only connected between one phase and the neutral. Then we need some power metering to measure the power which is drawn by the car. Afterwards, we will need some relays. So the relays are needed in combination with the DI sensor and other safe components to safely switch off the system, disconnect the car from the grid. Then we need some power line communication to build up a communication between the wall box or the charging station and the car. So the wall box can identify the power which can be drawn by the car and the state of charge. 
Next, we uh, see the green boxes and the green boxes contain the auxiliary supply, the human machine interface, the microcontroller, the billing system, which is also optional, and the wireless connectivity, for example, to get connection between the remote systems like your smartphone or a laptop and the wall box. Okay, so can we look under the hood a bit? What kind of components are we talking about? Well, if you're talking about the minimum required safety components inside or outside the wall box, then we need some kind of residential current feature sensor. Therefore, we need an AC and a DC feature current detection because the cable is damaged or we have some connection from the battery to the environment then we have DC currents can flow. Therefore, we need both AC and the DC safety system. We need the free phase fuse to protect against the overcurrents in a short circuit event or something like this. Then we need the relays to safety switch off the box from the car and vice versa. So if there is anything happens, for example, if the DC failure current sensor detects a problem there, then we can fast switch off the completely system and then we get the safety back again. So last but not least, we need some communication between the car and the wall box. That makes sense. So can you talk a little bit more about the sensor you mentioned? Can we look at that component in a bit more detail? Yes, we call it the WERCDS. It's a pretty new component from Word Electronic, but you can also find this from various other vendors. So we provide two versions at the moment from this sensor. One version is directly to feed through the cable. The other version is to directly connect the cable via terminal blocks to the PCB. And then the sensor is connected as a THD component on the PCB. The sensor itself contains in the electronic safety software. We can see now there are a few, let's say, pins we need to have at minimum. First, the VDD pin to power up the sensor for the internal power supply, which is usually 5 volt, for example. Then the pin 2 is the trip pin, the output pin of the sensor, which provides the signaling that something happened with the system and the controller now can sense this tripping signal and switch off the relays. Then we get a test in. This is used for calibration purpose. And then we got the pin four. This is the heartbeat signal, the so-called. It's a rectangular signal with 50% duty cycle and one kilohertz frequency. And if this signal is a little bit distorted or is interrupted, then the microcontroller can sense this. And now we need to assume something happened with the sensor and we can also switch up or switch down the whole system with the relays. And last but not least, the ground pin. Okay, so Andreas, you also mentioned power line communication as well. What does that look like in this case? Well, if you take a closer look at the AC plug, you can see there are not only L1, L2, L3 and neutral and protective earth. There are also two additional pins, so-called CP, this is the control pilot pin, and PP, the proximity pin. They are used for the communication between the car and the wall box, for example. And on the left side, we can see, okay, the charger interface. From the charger interface, we go out with our PLC interface to a ECU in the car, which converts the PLC signal to a CAN signal, because usually the main safety bus inside the car is still CAN. And from the CAN, we then connect to the main ECU of the car. And from the main ECU for the car, we connect the battery management system there. And in the case of any failure, like we have a damaged insulation in the cable or something else happens, we need to make sure that high voltage litzes, DC or AC, whatever, cannot damage the rest of the car, the rest electronic of the car, the rest of the electronic of the wall box, the low voltage systems. Therefore, we need some kind of safety insulation. And we usually use here the combination of transformer and a capacitor in a row on both sides. So either way, if you have a short circuit on the car side or at the charger side, always got some kind of safety insulation for the rest of the electronic components. 
Great. Now, what kind of solutions does Worth provide when it comes to power line communication? Well, for EV charging purposes, we developed a complete new part, which is pretty compact and provides the turn ratio one by one by one, which is common in the EV charging sector. And with this transformer, you uh, can handle up to 4,500 volt RMS insulation breakdown voltage from the primary to the secondary side. And the inductance is high enough to provide a clear signal over the whole required frequency range. Fantastic. Now, what about the AC-DC converter? Can Worth help me out here as well? Yes, we can. Inside the wall box, you will need some kind of auxiliary supply to power up all the internal electronic, like the microcontroller, the Wi-Fi model, and so on. And therefore, you need a switch mode power supply, which converts the AC input voltage into a low voltage DC output voltage. And because of the costs and of the size and the availability, you will use a so-called flyback converter. And for a flyback converter, you need a wide range of components. First, for example, you will need some combo choke to filter out the common mode interference. And with the strain ductance of the choke, you can also filter the differential mode. Therefore, we have low cost components, which are pretty high strain ductance and a small size, which is perfectly suited for this case. Then you will need some X capacitors to filter out the differential mode interference to not to pollute the grid side. Then you will need some Y capacitors to filter out the common mode interference as well. You will need some surge protection. Therefore, you can use our uh, varistors, which can handle high surge pulses. The main safety is guaranteed by the flyback transformer. And this is done by our daughter company, Midcom. There are various off-the-shelf components ready for use, so there's no need to develop a complete new part usually there. As well, you will need some bulk capacitors at the input side for the high voltage side. They can handle 450 volts and more. For the output side, polymer capacitors are a good choice. They have low ESR and can filter out the voltage ripple and the current ripple and you get a cleaner output voltage. For filtering input or at the output, the differential mode interference, you can also use our HV or low voltage differential rod cord chokes or TI chokes, we call it. So they are low cost chokes and pretty good for this job. Okay. Now we also need to keep in mind Ethernet here as well, right? What is worth offer in this case? Ethernet is pretty common to connect the wall box to the household system or installing a wall box at the company. You can also connect the wall box there to the IT control, you can do a remote control or have the billing system communication over it, for example. And to get a successful Ethernet communication, you need some special parts. First, you will need some discrete or integrated LAN magnetics. They are also used for functional safety. So if you have pretty long cables with DC current flowing over them, then this insulation will help you to provide more reliability overall. Additionally, we also provide the combo chokes and TVS diodes for high frequency signals. So the TVS diodes provide pretty low parasitic capacitance and combo chokes provide pretty low stray inductance. They are perfectly suited for the high frequency Ethernet signaling. Then we also provide uh, chip bead ferrites. They are intended to use at the VDD pins of the Ethernet Phi chip because the Ethernet Phi chip is usually a pretty big EMI pick, let's say. So it's producing a lot of high frequency harmonics on the VTD plane and area. And therefore, to filter out these high frequency components, the chip beat ferrites in combination with the MLCC blocking capacitors are the best choice to provide a clean system there. You will also need crystal quartz to generate the 25 megahertz uh, fundamental frequency for the Phi. This is then internally pushed up with a PLL to higher frequency component to provide the Ethernet communication speed. 
you will need also a good connection from the shield ground to the local digital ground. High voltage MLCCs, 2 kV or 3 kV are usually used. One nanofarad up to 10 nanofarad is usually used here. If you connect the shield with these capacitors to the local digital ground on both sides of the plug, for example, you will get a much better EMI performance than using only one capacitor or non-capacitor at all. For the digital system like the Ethernet Phi, we provide a variety of power modules starting, let's say, with 0.5 volt up to 3.3 volt, which is usually used here. And these are pretty small and are pretty good in air performance from an efficiency point of view and the EMI point of view. So, Andreas, what about RFID implementation? Can Worth help me here as well? Yes, we can. To get a successful implementation of an RFID system, you will need a good matching network and a good antenna in the end. The antenna is usually done as a low-cost antenna, FR4, and just microstrips on it. So this is cheaper than using a separate component as an antenna, and usually it's enough for RFID implementation. For a matching network, you will need special components. The matching network, this is used to provide the correct impedance on both sides from the PCP to the antenna, for example, 50 ohm. The matching network will help you to achieve this 50 ohm from the PCB side to the antenna. And to get pretty low losses in your matching network, you will need special components. We have a variety of RF inductors. The RF inductors have very high Q factors. The RDC of these inductors, so the resistance of the wire, is pretty low compared with the inductance value. On the same way, you will need some special RF capacitors. We also provide them. They also have pretty uh, low tolerances like the RF inductors and they provide you a very low losses. So the ESR value of these capacitors are pretty low. And if you have an issue with the range of your dipole antenna, then the reason is usually you have some metal objects nearby the antenna and you can enhance this transmitting or receiving range tremendously if you use some WE FIS RFID absorber sheet below the antenna. So you can just glue this absorber sheet on the backside on the antenna and this will shield the antenna from the metal objects and therefore the working frequency which is around 13 megahertz will not absorb anymore by the metal objects. Okay, so let's dig into the wireless connectivity part. What kind of solutions would you recommend for these kind of devices? For Wi-Fi, we provide our Calypso Wi-Fi radio module. This is perfectly suited for industry customers because we offer very deep hardware and software support and extended temperature range here up from minus 40 up to 85 degrees. So this is then a perfect choice for industry applications. Another possibility for LTE, for example, is our Adrastea module. The same is valid for the Wi-Fi model. It's also valid here. We provide the deep hardware and software support. This will help customer easily implement this in his system and getting pretty fast into the market. Bluetooth is also an option. We have the choice between different Bluetooth standards. The older standards is the Bluetooth 4.2, for example. For this standard, we provide the Proteos 1. And for the newer ones, up to Bluetooth Low Energy 5.1 with the Proteos E or Proteos 3, we provide modules which are pretty small in size. And also you will get from us the same good hardware and software support to get fast to the market and easy implement this into your hardware. It's not a low cost consumer product. It's really a pretty, pretty good industry product for industry customers. So, Andreas, let's switch gears and talk about that DC wall box. What's the difference between a DC and the AC wall box? First of all, for the OEM or car manufacturer, the DC wall box is beneficial because he can skip his onboard charger. Maybe in future we will see some cars which has no onboard charger anymore. This will help the OEM to save costs, save weight, 
and safe space inside the car. Another uh, advantage is with a DC wall box, you can have easily bi-directional energy flow. This is also uh, possible in theory with AC wall boxes, but with a DC wall box, you can achieve higher system efficiencies. For example, in combination with rooftop solar or a home battery system, because in the end they are working with DC. Uh, additionally, you can also choose between 400 and 800 volts output voltage. So if you have a car with a 400 volt traction battery, you can adjust this in the DC wall box. As well, if you have a car with 800 volts or more, you can also adjust this in the DC wall box. The wall box can fit perfectly to the EV. The disadvantage is still the prices for DC wall boxes are pretty high. So at the moment, most of them cost over uh, 2000 euros, for example. But I'm pretty sure in future, we will see much more cheaper wall boxes. Some car manufacturers will trend to DC wall boxes and other car manufacturers are trending more to AC wall boxes in vehicle to grid applications. So at the moment, it's not pretty clear where we go to. But I think 2025, we will have a clear path in which direction it will lead. I think that we will see both technologies in parallel. You see a solar panel provides DC output voltage. We can feed this into the solar inverter and the solar inverter can directly feed out DC to the DC wall box. And as the traction battery is also DC, the overall system efficiency is pretty high because we do not have to convert the DC into the AC and back and forward again. And this will help to achieve much more efficiency. Okay, let's take a little bit of a closer look inside the DC wall box. We can see here a block diagram of a famous topology. You can find more than one topology which can be done inside a DC wall box. But this one is pretty famous. You will find them in many reference designs. So on the left side, we can see the AC grid where we feed in the grid power into the DC wall box. And as it is a bi-directional version, the power flow can be also from the battery back into the AC grid. The second stage, we can see the overcurrent protection so the fuses and the surge protection against lightning strikes. So this will absorb the over voltage spikes, which are the result of a lightning strike. The section is the EMI filter, which helps to fulfill the requirements. We will need this EMI filter to protect the AC grid against the, let's say, high frequency noise, which are generated by the DC wall box or the car. The fourth station is the totem pole power factor correction, PFC. This is needed to provide a power factor close to one. So without the PFC, we'll draw a lot of out of phase current from the AC grid, which then will destabilize the AC grid if many of such devices draw out of phase currents. So therefore, it's mandatory to use a PFC over a certain power limit. The fifth section is the DC link, the capacitor bank, which special capacitors. The sixth stage is the high voltage DC DC. This is needed because of two reasons. First, we need safety insulation between the grid and the car. And the second reason is with the high voltage DC DC, we can adapt the output voltage, what is required by the car. So with this DC DC, we can adjust 400 volt at the output or 800 volt at the output. And vice versa, we can adapt the traction battery voltage if we feed back power from a battery inside the grid. And the last section is called traction battery of the car. Okay. So Andreas, you also mentioned DC link capacitors. So why do we need DC link caps? And can you explain that a bit more? Yes. Why do we need a DC link capacitor? Every big power conversion inverters like free phase motor inverters, photovoltaic, automotive, medical, or like here in the wall box, we need some kind of stabilization of the DC link voltage. And that's the main reason why we have to use these kind of capacitors. We would like to get this ripple, like we can see in the picture on the lower right. The goal is to have this ripple in the DC link section as low as possible. And of course, the higher the capacitance, the lower the ripple will be. Okay, so how do you calculate DC link capacitance? We need to keep ripple voltage in mind here, right? Yes, 
we can easily roughly calculate the required capacitance. Therefore, we need to know the maximum load in watts. Then we need to know the working frequency of our inverter. Then we need to uh, know the maximum input voltage of the DC link system. And last but not least, the designer need to specify or to limit the maximum ripple voltage. This is a value which has to be done by himself. So this is a factor he can play a little bit with. Another important factor is the RMS current because we are using a DC link capacitor. AC current will flow through this capacitor or capacitors. This current will heat up the capacitor. And the higher the RMS current, the higher the temperature. And therefore, it's also important to make a rough calculation here to be in a safe side. And if one capacitor cannot handle your requirements for the RMS currents and for the capacitance below, it's pretty common to connect more capacitors in parallel. Okay, so... Andreas, how do these two technologies compare? If you're talking about two different technologies, interesting for the market, for the most applications, one is the film capacitor technology, the another one is the aluminum electrolyte capacitor. Both had advantages and disadvantages, so the capacitance per volume is pretty high with the aluminum electrolyte capacitor but his voltage is limited to actually 650 volt DC. Therefore, if you have an 800 volt system, you will always need two electrolyte capacitors in a row, whereas a film capacitor alone can handle up to 1.3 kV. The lifetime of a film capacitor is 10 times higher than the aluminum capacitor. So for long life applications or high reliability applications, a film capacitor will be the better choice. The ESR of a film capacitor is pretty low, whereas the aluminum electrolyte capacitor got a pretty high ESR. That means if you have a big AC current flowing through the capacitor, the aluminum electrolyte will heat up faster and will degrade faster. So that his lifetime will shorten. This is often not acceptable. But the energy density per volume is higher with the electrolyte capacitor. Therefore, you will need maybe a lower volume compared to the film capacitor. Both capacitors have designs where they can be used, but you cannot say this is worse or this is good. Both of them have their advantages and disadvantages. Excellent. Well, Andreas, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about this topic from Worth Electronic. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talks section of EE Journal. You can't miss it, it's right across the top. Or head on over to YouTube, youtube.com slash eejournal. <laughs>